There's almost 3,000 words in this script. Buckle up. This is going to be an Ong one. In the beginning was the word. I mean, not really. In the beginning was a big bang, eons of astrophysical shenanigans. Then, after a few billion years of evolution, there was the spoken word. We've no way of knowing precisely when our evolutionary ancestors could do something we might describe as talking to each other. Estimates range from 60,000 to 2.5 million years ago. But we've been chit-chatting at least 10 times longer than we've been trying to capture those conversations in markings. Five millennia ago, some clever Sumerians started using clay tablets with hatch marks for counting purposes. Bring a cow to your local king as tribute, and some royal bean counter marks a clay tablet and throws it in an oven. Now there's a robust record of that cow, so robust that we can pretty much read it today. Those markings became more detailed as their use spread, eventually morphing into scripts of consonants, and then, around 3,000 years ago, the Greeks, or maybe the Phoenicians, threw vowels in, creating the first full alphabet. Then there was the word, at least as we know it today, a sequence of symbols that tell a savvy reader, with astonishing accuracy and durability, the sounds the author would make if they were there in the room. Several thousand years after that invention, writing has become an indispensable pillar of every human system we interact with. The floor beneath you is built to some textual specification in a book of building or municipal codes. The underwear you're wearing are decorated with letters that tell you what they're made of. Even the application you're using to listen to this episode is a binary translation of very specific text typed into a software development tool. Since the invention of the internet and smartphones, text has also encompassed an increasing proportion of the ways we experience each other. Text messages, emails, blogs, social media, Discord, Signal. You might post pictures on Insta or FaceTime a friend, but for many, Text is the primary medium for connecting with coworkers, with government, with friends, or family, by reading what they have written and writing to them in return. Compared to famous cultural and technological transformations like the agricultural revolution or the industrial revolution, that gradual 3,000 year transition from mostly oral to mostly textual communication might seem relatively inconsequential. Aren't they mostly just two flavors of the same thing? But according to philosopher and historian Walter Ong in his book, Orality and Literacy, the shift from speech to text marks a sea change in human thought and consciousness, a transition so radical that you and I, who have lived our entire lives in the shadow of written words, don't appreciate just how different our cognitive apparatus is from the vast majority of humans who have ever lived. To see what Ong is on about, try to imagine yourself in a world that has no notion of text. No websites, no books, no letters, no written laws or records, none of it. Your memory, and the memory of those around you, is your solitary connection to the past, to anything that's not currently in front of you. History, science, geography, game rules, recipes, every scrap of knowledge that you can access relies entirely on your capacity to either remember it yourself, day after day, year after year, or to talk face to face with someone else who remembers. There's no such thing as going to look something up in the library. There's not even any way to take notes. If you forget exactly what goes into that soup, or where that good fishing spot was, or your great grandma's middle name, that knowledge is instantly gone forever. Imagine trying to think in that context, to build on existing knowledge and concepts in a way that nets you some useful insight into the world around you. You certainly can't organize your ideas in an outline or consult your notes. Your capacity to wind your way through a string of difficult reasoning depends entirely on your ability to hold each intermediate step in your mind until you hopefully arrive at some conclusion. If you run out of working memory before you get there, you're wasting your time. And if the conclusion itself is too complicated to recall easily, you might as well not have bothered. Of course, pondering to yourself for hours on end with no way to record your progress is pretty boring anyway. If you have a real head scratcher, it's much easier to address it in dialogue with an articulate and insightful companion, or maybe to bring the topic up in a group of several people who can share the cognitive load of memory and analysis, although there might be more shouting. For a non-literate society, memory is also a finite resource which entirely circumscribes that society's persistence through time. Cultural know-how, history, language, ideology, traditions, allegiances and grudges, 
they all rely entirely on how memorable those things are to each subsequent generation. There's a constant evolutionary pressure on the entire corpus of knowledge and convention that makes up an oral society, each element of which becomes ruthlessly optimized for ease of recall by necessity. Nothing that's tricky for your kids to remember will make the cut. Outdated or incidental laws, boring history, anything that's not immediately relevant or compelling enough to grab someone's attention and stick with them vanishes. This probably explains why there are certain patterns of rhetoric and storytelling which recur in all sorts of oral cultures. Redundancy, repetition, redundancy, catchy aphorisms and cliches in storytelling, improvised flourishes to make a tale memorable for a specific audience, annual rituals that harness powerful mnemonic techniques like music or dances. These sorts of strategies facilitate the accumulation and replication of the maximum amount of knowledge from generation to generation when there's no other vehicle for that knowledge or the perpetuation of a society than whatever's in people's noggins. Pretty cool, right? It all makes a kind of sense, but Ong argues that it's not just a neat thought experiment. It describes a mental apparatus that's operating under fundamentally different principles, such that many of its instincts and reflexes would be alien to those of us who have only known literate society. For example, reading and writing are solitary activities. We look for a private corner somewhere to curl up with our books or a notepad if we want to get some serious thinking done. We certainly wouldn't seek out a group of people to argue with. Our focus for intellectual work is primarily visual, not auditory. We read, we look at graphs and figures, and we tend to assume printed text is more authoritative than anything we hear in dialogue. In an oral culture, sound is where you get the raw materials to do intellectual work, and the most reliable secondary source of information is a person willing to make and defend claims to your face. You might roll your eyes at childish proverbs, repetitive language, or cliches, but for an oral culture inhabitant, the more something looks like a trite aphorism, the more it's likely to be a precious nugget of cultural wisdom, worn smooth by the centuries it has survived intact because it's so important to know. These sorts of habits aren't just peculiar to us, they describe an approach to intellectual work that's totally backwards from our own. Perhaps the most striking difference Ong highlights is the sort of cognitive distance from language and ideas that has been fostered by text. In an oral culture, words like dog are only ever encountered when there's a speaker and they're mostly about the here and now. They're alive in a sense, urgent. Some person is trying to get your attention and tell you something they think you ought to know. Dog, using air from their own lungs. They'll probably adjust that message so that you specifically will understand it, so you'll be more likely to believe and remember it the first time they say it, with nuances added by tone of voice, facial expression, hand gestures, and so on to remove any ambiguity. In contrast, when you or I think of a word, the first thing that springs to mind is probably an image, a set of printed or rendered letters, probably in Times New Roman or Arial, and directed at no one in particular, a general audience, whoever's around to look at it. Because of that generality, the author has, hopefully, thought long and hard about every possible interpretation of the word in that context, and has maybe placed it in a complicated sentence with lots of subordinate clauses and clever phrasing that only makes sense if you read and reread it a few times. The subjective experience of someone grabbing your shoulder and saying, Doc, is much different than gazing at this block of letters in a book or on a phone screen. In a spoken context, a word is an act, and once uttered, it only exists in your memory or not at all. You can mull it over, but compared to being able to physically manipulate it, to pick up a material object and literally hold it at arm's length, squint at it, compare it alongside other similar objects, spoken words don't lend themselves nearly as much to analysis and abstraction. You can challenge an oral statement if you think the speaker is bullshitting you, but that comes with all sorts of complex social and relationship dynamics. Written words are static, impersonal, things ripe for dissection. With that sort of distance, the ideas represented by those things also seem sort of disconnected and impersonal. What are love, God, justice, or infinity but words? It's also an incredible catalyst for introspection and consciousness. If you're reading, analyzing, and dissecting texts that you've written like an old diary entry, you are made suddenly and intensely aware of the distance that can exist between yourself, whatever that is, and your thoughts. 
Ong believes that this cognitive shift from the living, breathing immediacy of spoken words to the cool, analytic distance of written words took millennia. Plato famously wrote down his discomfort with all this newfangled writing stuff, couching his written arguments in dialogues so they wouldn't feel quite so alien. St. Augustine lived about 1,400 years after the invention of the fully voweled alphabet, and in his Confessions, he writes in awe of his teacher, Archbishop Aurelius Ambrosius, who is capable of an astounding feat, reading silently. This suggests that we hadn't become a fully literate culture by Augustine's time, as handwritten manuscripts were treated more or less like aids for spoken recitation and memorization, an accessory for speech. The final nail in the coffin was the widespread adoption of the movable type printing press. Suddenly, at least for academics, words became mass-produced ubiquitous things. That was when we transformed into a decidedly literate culture. And that shift was what prompted an explosion of all sorts of new philosophical and scientific thinking. The way that story is usually told, the printing press was just a vehicle accelerating the spread of new ideas and observations. But it's not clear why simply doing those ubiquitous human activities faster would result in social and cultural upheaval. What was new was the sudden need to communicate your thinking and findings unambiguously in text, to describe exactly how you set up your experiment and what you saw, or how you were defining freedom in a way that was fit for printing. Many academics taught themselves a form of Latin that was almost useless for spoken conversation, but very handy for producing printed text that could be read by other academics, regardless of their native tongue. These people transitioned from a world where the spoken word was the most reliable source of truth to a world where the most authoritative information available was written in a language that wasn't even meant to be spoken aloud. In Ong's version of history, print wasn't just a vehicle. It was a mold we poured all knowledge and culture into, a new shape for human consciousness. As a result, you and I have never known a world that was not utterly dominated by text where constitutions, holy books, dictionaries, scientific journals, Supreme Court decisions, ISO standards, contracts, and news articles were not treated like foundations of knowledge in society. The sciences we use as organs of truth about the universe are based entirely on publications. But Ong notes that, as much as we behave as though writing is the bedrock of civilization, it's really a byproduct, a convenient technology built on top of our evolved capacity for spoken language. The enthusiastically literate way we approach business, academia, politics, medicine, really just about everything, is kind of a novelty in the scope of human history. Sometimes we can see traces of our intellectual origins poking through into the modern world. University lectures, ritual recitations of holy texts, live concerts, and political speeches still bear some resemblance to the mnemonic and cognitive traditions found in primary oral cultures. But it's always a little weird trying to account for their non-literate features. How am I supposed to listen to the lecturer while I'm examining this detailed graph on the overhead and taking notes? Why do we all have to sit here and listen to the priest reciting the holy book? Surely we could just read it faster ourselves? Which leads us to the smartphone-saturated present. Ong notes that modern innovations in media like film, television, podcasts, and YouTube are sometimes used in a way that channels aspects of that original oral paradigm. They encourage communal gathering into an audience. They use rhetorical and mnemonic devices to convince and remind us of things. They use sound to convey meaning rather than relying entirely on sight. But we experience them through our modern, literate cognitive apparatus. We can't switch all that off just because we're participating in something our ancient ancestors would probably recognize. Ong calls this secondary orality, a sort of cosplay of those traditional forms without the oral culture mental framework they're echoing. We gather to listen to a celebrity who sure feels like a friend and a member of our community, even if we've never really met them. We don't pay too much attention to what they're saying, because if anything's really important, surely someone will write it down. We value the intimacy and immediacy of something like a live performance, but only because we've reasoned to ourselves about abstract ideas like authenticity or uniqueness in quiet moments of introspection, and decided it's important to care about. When you struggle to make sense of Donald Trump quotes in news articles, it's not because you couldn't understand what he was saying if he were speaking to you. 
But because you're used to reading quotes, especially quotes from presidents, that have been carefully formulated in a way that will look good in text. Even when we're trying to do the oral culture stuff, we get confused if it doesn't comport with our literate culture expectations. Ong's ideas have made me keenly aware of when I'm engaging with the world of text and literate thought. On an average day, I write myself to-do lists, I read emails and chat with people on Discord and Signal, I whittle down the giant pile of books next to my bed, constantly scribbling in my journal or my computer as I go. Like everybody else, I read news articles about events halfway across the world minutes after they happen. There are also tens of thousands of written laws and engineering standards that regulate my behavior and my environment. So much of my life is only possible because of the unique characteristics of writing as a medium. But now I find myself wondering what trade-offs that requires. My messaging apps may allow me to chat with friends and family at any hour of the day, but I can't hear if they're feeling down or notice if they got a haircut unless they think to type it out. Keeping up on world news makes me feel well-informed, but I have no personal relationship to the authors of those articles, and the traditionally neutral journalistic tone feels even more distant. I might care about those events in an abstract way, but definitely not the way I would if someone were telling me what they had seen face to face. My local dog park has a list of rules so extensive and tedious that it wouldn't last a week if it wasn't a printed sign. All this is to say, I'm more aware that the main way I know and think about my world and myself is through an annotated set of 26 characters arranged in various patterns that resemble speech. It's an impressive technology, and it's absolutely essential for the structured, abstract cognition necessary to survive in our culture. But there are valuable things, valuable language even, that it can't capture. And despite numerous heroic attempts over the last 400 some odd years, it hasn't managed to consume everything. Something to reflect on the next time you're doom scrolling on Twitter. Do you find Ong's theory of the history of human cognition convincing? Do you find that text shapes your thinking in ways that you might not have considered before? Please leave a text space comment below and let me know what you think. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to blah blah subscribe blah share. And don't stop thunking. Dog!